UC Santa Cruz is located on the unceded territory of the Awazwa speaking Yupi tribe, the Ama Mutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Lopez, and I'm a first year intern here at the American Indian Resource Center. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am Lakota. The AIRC is dedicated to supporting the needs of the American Indian students at UCSC, and is one of the six resource centers on campus. The AIRC is also home to the People of Color Sustainability Collective. Throughout the year, we host speakers, workshops, and presentations that raise, raise awareness about issues that pertain to Indigenous people. Hi, my name is Kamiko Hostler, and I'm also an intern for the American Indian Resource Center. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe. I'm honored to introduce tonight's speaker, Chef Crystal Wapipa. Chef Wapipa, a member of the Kickapoo Tribe in Oklahoma, grew up in Oakland, California, in the urban Native community, and learned how to cook many styles of Native food. She has received the Indigenous Artist and Activist Award and was inducted into the Native American Almanac as the first Native American woman entrepreneur catering business. Today, Chef Wapipa will discuss her approach to cooking and do a live demo for us. If at any point during the event, you have a question for Chef Wapipa, please send a private chat message to the Zoom user named Ask Questions here. We'll do our best to ask your questions during the Q&A session following the presentation. Thank you. And everyone, please welcome Chef Crystal Wapipa. Well, hello everybody. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Hi everyone. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> hello, my name is Chef Krista Wapipa. I am Kickapoo and I'm Sack and Fox from Oklahoma. I was born and raised here, of course, and here in the urban area, Bay and Oakland in the Bay Area. And um, I've been cooking indigenous foods, um, let's say, I'm gonna say 25, 30 years. <laughs> and something that I love to do, and I love just to show people how beautiful the foods are and healthy and where it comes from, that's the main important thing. And so I chose to do this live demo of the three sisters. Three sisters can mean different things for everyone, but for me, it means, what we're doing now, we're in November, we're celebrating Native American Heritage Month. We, this is called Indigenous Things. So when you think about the name, what does it mean to you? And for me, since I grew up here in the Bay Area, we're really pretty much a, diverse all over, but I've been very, very humble and grateful to be raised here in Oakland. I had a very unique childhood growing up here in the Native community. Um, we never celebrated Thanksgiving in my family. Uh, we always went to Alcatraz to celebrate <clears throat> the sunrise ceremony. And I always had to put those two together. Like one, I was born on Thanksgiving. My birthday is November 27th. So I was born on Thanksgiving. So every so often my birthday follows on Thanksgiving. But then the other, when I think about Thanksgiving, I think about my grandparents. I think about my mom. I think about me being as a child and how very blessed I was to be raised around a close knit family that we held our traditional foods really tight. And I knew at a very young age, the meaning of it. And so I chose three sisters. Um, three sisters can mean different things for everyone. For me personally, it means strength. It means these three sisters, the beans, corn, and the squash, um, how, how everything revolves around around them, but it's almost kind of like something that, um, for instance, um, 
how the ocean, how it relies on air and how the fish relies on it. So to me, that's what it means. And it also means um, our ancestors. Um, for me, I think of the corn, I think of my grandmother. I even think of my great grandmother. I think of the squash. I think, you know, I think of the beans, you know, my family loved beans. <laughs> and so today what I got, um, I wanted to do my version of a Three Sisters. Everybody does different versions of it, but we're gonna do a warm Three Sisters small salad. And um, what I got here is I have, I don't know if you can see this, but I have some white hominy corn. Um, and then also I, what I did is cut up my butternut squash and I pre-cooked everything um, on that part because how long it takes for the squash, that takes a really short time. But um, for the squash, how I diced it up, but as I put this together and I'm gonna saute it and I'm gonna show you, and then I'm gonna come and complete the stories of it. But then also I have one of my favorite beans um, is actually the brown temporary bean. See, this one right here. I like it um, for one, just the meaning of it. I got this one from Ramona Farms. Um, I've been using <clears throat> her things for a long, long time. And I love this bean um, because of the texture of it. And you can do so many things with it. Sometimes if we go ahead and get the cultivated bean, um, it, it tends to like mush up and get really mushy, but this one holds together just fine. And then also what I wanted to put, I wanted to put um, a little dried blueberries. Say what? Dried blueberries. Yes, dried blueberries into the three sister. And then also we're going to do a little pumpkin seeds. Can you see little pumpkin seeds? Um, actually, I'm going to roast them right now just to kind of, I like that little roasted kind of toasted dough taste. So I'm going to add just a little bit on there. I want you guys to see my, my um, stove. Can you guys kind of, can you guys see? I have electric. So, you know, um, me personally, I love gas, but I have electric. So with electric, it tends to either heat up really fast and it tends to just kind of, um, you got to like really know your, your balance. Like if you have gas, you can pretty much control the heat. And then also what I'm doing right here. So I threw just a little pumpkin seeds here on this iron skillet. I love iron skillet. And then I'm just, I'm just going to toss this kind of toast them, toss them up a little bit in here. And then after um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them all into the pan. And what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, I want you guys to get a good visual right here. Sorry, my, cam my, my camera person's out. <laughs> and then, um, so what I'm just gonna just toast this just a little bit, get a good little toast on there. And then although I have the hominy, and what I did is I cooked the hominy for around, well, about three hours you can cook it, but I cooked it for like two and a half. And what I did beforehand is I soaked it. And so this one right here is a real nice, good, fresh white hominy, okay? And I soaked it. I always soak, I always soak my corn right before. It all kind of depends. So if you want, for instance, if you're like, oh my gosh, where am I gonna get hominy at? You know, you can always go into um, <clears throat> a market, indigenous market, or either you know, since we're in COVID times, you can pretty much um, find it online if you want. But um, I like using the white hominy. Um, I like the texture of it. Um, the fresh hominy is the best personally for me. And then um, what I've done right here is actually um, one of my, um, one of my, my brothers actually grew this squash. This squash all together is, um, it's mixed in between, it's a, he did a crossover between a kombucha squash, squash and then also a Lakota squash, so it's all into one. And so what I've done with this one is I just, I cut it up and then I pretty much like, I love squash because how we can save it and how we can harvest it. And I'm going to, as, as I'm toasting my um, pumpkin seeds, I'm just going to kind of tell you just a little bit of my journey as an Indigenous chef. Um, well, 
I noticed a lot at a very young age as being an indigenous chef, um, even just me, just being um, crystal, <laughs> especially here in the Bay Area, how we have so many different restaurants and um, different ethnic restaurants. We have everything, but no native. And I always kind of, that always kind of stuck with me as I would go to Oklahoma. I would go there in the summer times and be with my grandparents and my family, either we'd do ceremonies and we'd go to powwows and stuff like that. Then we would come back here to the Bay Area and we had some awesome food. My grandfather was a hunter, which I love. He always had deer all the time, rabbit, we had a squirrel, we had all that stuff. And then that's something that um, it really kind of grasped me at a very young age and something that I really took to. So um, when people ask me um, why, how you became an indigenous chef, um, it was something at a very early age for me that um, it just came so naturally. Um, that's the foods that I always seen that were beautiful. Um, even when I was in culinary school, you know, I went to a French culinary school, but I wanted to use that just as for my tools, as, um, you know, just a skill set on that part. But as time and time went by, um, I realized that I have something that um, I can share not just with my family, but also my community. And that's something that I love to do. So I, I love the Bay Area community. I love people to reach out from their community and ask me to cook because I feel that our foods are healing. And I feel that our foods are very special and unique in a way of our health and our wellness. For me, it's all intertwined in our mind and our heart and our spirit. And that's something that my grandmother had left um, with me and always told me how to think before I cook and wh what's going on in your head before you cook because other people eat it and you can talk with your food. And so basically I like talking with my hands and obviously I can talk with my mouth. <laughs> but um, anyway, so as I'm, to um, as I'm toasting this, um, I end up um, just catering a lot um, for the community. And um, I really loved every bit of it. And I still do whenever I have the opportunity. But since we're in COVID time, a lot of things has changed. But as my journey as being an indigenous chef, um, it's just pretty much um, loving my community as my community loves me. And I always talk about that first because there'll be no Wapi Paws Kitchen without without people supporting in my community, definitely. And um, it this kind of became one thing after another. I ended up going to an entrepreneurial program called La Cuisina in San Francisco. I had mentors. Um, they taught me a lot just about the business and about um, pretty much a lot, a lot of things. But I also asked a question to myself um, when they were asking about what foods, um, how they really didn't know, honestly, really didn't know how our beautiful our foods are and how much as our foods are from here. And to me, that was um, a very educational stand back, like, whoa, what am I getting myself into? Um, I need to go and learn. I need to go and um, <clears throat> learn, uh, obviously, from our elders and learn to go back to Oklahoma and learn our foods. And that really was an eye opener. But all at the same time, I enjoyed uh, me learning as I'm going and they're very patient with me in the catering business as I just start catering. You know, my one of my first caterings it was literally the 400 people <laughs> and only if they knew I did I catered to like 400 people because I come from a big family and our family always cooked so when they said 400 I didn't even flinch it was just like oh okay 400 so we did um a really awesome um dried sweet corn with that one so and then I just end up you know one thing led to another and I just end up being very very um blessed and very humbled of getting these opportunities and cooking um, indigenous foods and the more and more I start cooking for people in our community and more and more I start to know more of the knowledge and actually the educational part and meeting with farmers meeting with 
seed keepers and meeting with all these beautiful people that are doing the same thing I'm doing because I love to cook. I love to create with all these different indigenous ingredients and all these different um, things that people come at when they harvest. That's that's what I love to do. And um, to meet people like that and to actually, um, to actually work with people, they have the same love as you do for our foods, anything. To me personally, anything's in, um, impossible on that. Not everything that you've been seeing till this date, and I've been doing this for over 12 years now, um, it is flourishing the way I always want, want it to flourish and always see it to flourish. So anytime somebody beats that mile mark and does that mile mark, I just get so excited and I get so happy because we came so far as indigenous people, we came so far as farmers, hunters and growers and all these knowledgeable people, we came so far, but we're still, we're still doing it. We're still doing it. We're still have that path. Even as me being a, um, a young, <clears throat> young girl, when I was on Alcatraz, things are happening. Um, things might not be happening in a fast pace as we want it to, where it's, it's happening the way creator wants it to happen personally. That's how I believe. And I see these beautiful things happening, but at the same time, um, I've been really fortunate to um, have Wabi Paw's Kitchen and a lot of people wondering why is she calling it Wabi Paw's Kitchen? Well, Wabi Paw's Kitchen is really named after my family. Um, anytime we, I would go to my grandmother, my grandmother cooked all the time. Any, she's always had a pot of beans and she's always, she's always had food no matter, um, no matter what and how she provided for six children. And that was always my inspiration. So I named, that's why I named it Wapi Paw's Kitchen. But what does Wapi Paw mean? Wapi Paw means um, leader of the eagles and, and Kikupu. And um, it means um, strength, you know? And so that's why I named it. So if anybody ever wonder why, you know, as I, as I would go to different programs and stuff and they will say, well, you got to find another different indigenous um, name for your business, you know, but I said, no, it's Wapi Paw. <laughs> it might be hard to say, but it's Wapi Paw. So anyways, let me get on with the cooking part as I'm doing the three sisters. So I just got them toasting um, the pumpkin seeds, which they look very, very nice. And I'm just going to add them right here. And then just remember what I said, um, if anybody at home or they're recording this so you can look back at it. Um, again, I have white hominy and again, I have um, a brown temporary bean. And then I also have a kombucha and it's a, um, well, but a cross between, I'm gonna say a kombucha and Lakota squash, okay? And then what we're gonna garnish it with is I have some, to me, this is like, this is this right here. Let me show you guys. This right here is the most beautiful indigenous foods you can see for me. And um, what I have right here, what I'm just going to garnish it with is I just, I toasted some culinary sage. And I love just the smell of the culinary sage. And what I've done is how it toasted and it kind of curls up just like this. I'm gonna, um, we either can put the whole stem in there, but I'm just gonna get the little stem off right there so we can put it in there, but we can also add in there if you like. But this is gonna be my three sisters um, warm salad tonight <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> but, um, so I have my iron skillet going on right over here. I'm gonna kind of bring this over. And then I'm gonna coat it with, of course, a Sika Hill olive oil. Um, I'm just gonna kind of coat it, not a lot, just enough where it can get um, kind of fired up here a little bit, okay? So I'm just gonna um, add that in just a little bit right there. And then right while we're waiting for this to get all nice and hot, I'm just gonna um, tell you just a little bit about um, <clears throat> what's been going on since COVID times for Wapi Paws Kitchen. Um, pretty much um, everything came to a halt. 
Um, it, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Some people say, well, we're doing this, we're doing that. No, everything came to a halt during COVID time. And it was such um, the one eye opener to be humble and to be grateful that my family's healthy and um, being safe and, you know, of course, social distancing. And all at the same time, I have four employees. And I was so more, I was more worried about them um, at any, and anything I was worried about them, what's going to be taking place um, during COVID and as we're on lockdown and everything. And, <clears throat> and so I just end up start thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You know, one thing led to another where um, literally um, I've been so blessed and they have been so blessed that we all work, you know, we all work together and they end up doing other things in their other in their path but they are still with Wapi Cross Kitchen which I'm very humble and I'm very grateful for but all at the same time I I was thinking how can I save this business that I built for so and so many years and so that's when we, I end up calling and talking to other business owners, um, indigenous business owners actually, and seeing if I come up with a product where they support and they are more than willing, more than um, happy to. So um, that's when I came up with the wild rice amaranth bar and I ended up putting everything together. And so we're just doing this until um, December, um, which has been really pretty much saving um, um, saving our kitchen, saving so many different things and that has to do with logistic businesses. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, so we've been really humble and really grateful on that. And then we end up doing um, a social dishes thing, a drop off catering. And so that's been pretty nice. Um, I kind of like um, just little baby steps here and there that we're doing. So if you ever wonder what is Waffle Paws Kitchen now, we're pretty much really busy with the bar. <laughs> and so we've been really um, grateful and humble on that. And so just slowly but surely kind of getting back into it because of we're in different times, basically. And so as I'm going to continue to talk and cook, okay, I got my, my pan all nice and olive oil up. Yes, I used the olive oil. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the bean and put them in the pan. Look, I like that sound. You guys hear that sound? And then I'm going to throw the corn in there. So we're going to have two. The reason why I have the beans and the corn in here, can you see this? The reason why I have the beans and the corn is because if I put the squash in there, it's gonna kind of mush up. And so it's coming to a really pretty color, which I like. And um, it's smelling really good in here. And if I'm, you're gonna probably ask, is, is she gonna put salt and pepper? No, I'm not gonna put no salt and pepper because I'm shooting for all these natural organic flavors that we got going here, okay? So I'm just gonna warm it up just a little bit in here. I just think this is so pretty. And then what I'm gonna do, as remember I told you that I toasted my culinary sage, I'm gonna add my culinary sage in here. And I'm just gonna kind of sprinkle it up in there. You can get all fancy and cut it if you want, but I'm just gonna sprinkle it in there because this is where the flavor is gonna be. Remember when you're working with culinary sage, I always say, um, just kind of go really lightly, not too heavy on it because it can totally overtake on the flavor. But it's the colors is amazing. So at the same time, I'm going to add my squash. I'm going to add the squash in here. And I'm going to also give you guys a little close up so you can see exactly what I'm doing. So I added the squash. If you ask how much all together, we're gonna say a half a cup of each, half a cup of the corn, half a cup of the beans, half a cup of the squash, okay? And that means you got one and a half cup of a salad. <laughs> okay, so as I'm mixing all that together, I'm gonna get you guys a little view here from my phone. Can you see how pretty this is? Isn't that gorgeous? Okay, and then, 
we're going to do all this um, within three minutes. Um, it doesn't take very long once you have to pre-cook everything. But if I had to go for minute wise, it's going to, um, you're probably looking at with all the time and everything, you're probably looking at about an hour and a half too. And then what I got right here is me. What I like is I'm gonna just put a little handful of cranberries in it. And you know how sometimes when you get these dried cranberries, once you put them in here, they can, they'll soften up, okay? And then also what I got going on here last is purple onions. I'm just gonna throw just not very many, just a little bit of purple onions in there. And then I'm gonna stir it. And then I'm gonna put back our toasted pumpkin seeds. That's gonna go in there. Throw it all in there. And this is smelling so good and looking so beautiful. I'm gonna do another little close up. Here we go. Can you see how pretty that is? All right. And this would also be good for Thanksgiving. Um, if it's just you or, you know, um, a few people, this is something also really good to make. And then I'm going to turn it off since I have electric and plus I have an iron skillet. It will continue to cook. <clears throat> but. And putting that in there. And then from there, see where we're getting the, you're having, we're having the sweetness inside the three sisters. And then we're also having um, the squash. It has its own natural flavors. We have the temporary beans and we also have um, the white hominy. And so you're getting all these beautiful flavors all in one. And then we have the toasted um, culinary sage and then we have the purple onions. And then the best part to me that really makes this is the cranberries because you have that little sweet taste to it. I really would like for you guys to try this at home. Okay. And so I'm going to let this set for a little bit. And then after that, and then I'm going to go ahead and plate it. But I just wanted to share um, <clears throat> the three sisters with you um, from what it means for me and what it means actually when I, like, when I think of three sisters, I see these three beautiful just beautiful um, from here and something that it's all intertwined all together. And I love, I, I love what it represents. I love the meaning of it. Um, I couldn't see myself being an indigenous chef without it. Um, it makes me think of my ancestors and definitely makes me think of my grandmother and um, how much she loved all three of these things. And <clears throat> also what I'm gonna do right here is I'm gonna plate it. I am gonna put it on, I was gonna put it on this plate, but I'm gonna put it on a white plate so you guys can see see it a little bit more because since we're all on Zoom, um, I'm gonna put it onto a plate and you know, feel free if you wanna add a little salt to it, you can add some little natural salt. But me personally, I like it like this. And then what I have is I have these little dried blueberries. I'm going to add this little bit on there because I'm going to have this um, nice, good, savory taste with the, with the squash. And then also how I'm going to top it with, I have a little bit of um, sunflower petals. You're like, what is this woman making? And I just think this is so gorgeous. Look at that. You see it? So. What we have right here is we have some squash, we have a temporary bean, we have, um, <clears throat> of course, the white hominy, and then we have cranberries, we have the dried blueberries, we have something I love about these. These are the <clears throat> sunflower petals I put on there. And you don't have to get all like, you know, where should you get sunflower petals, all that other stuff. You know, it's just something, I just wanted to create something what the three sisters mean to me. And then of course, um, this is one of my favorite is this toasted raw pumpkin seeds. Come on. <laughs> the raw pumpkin seeds, which is really great. And that was so, so good. So you guys know what I'm gonna have for dinner. But 
I just wanted to share just a little of my story of, <clears throat> of Wapipa's Kitchen and what it means to me for the three sisters and what we got going for the future. And we're looking bright for the future. And I'm doing something that I love and I believe in and something that I feel that our community needs um, is in our healing. Food is healing, yes. Um, you're more than welcome to ask me any kind of questions. Um, I love to answer. And if you want me to put up the plate again, I will. And I just wanna say thank you for your time and thank you for you guys' um, support um, with Wapi Paws Kitchen. And it means a lot to all of us. And I just wanna say um, thank you for coming into my home and thank you for letting me in yours. <laughs> thank you. Chef, we're getting we're getting our uh, questions ready for you. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, That's okay. I'm gonna take a bite. <laughs> okay. That sounds perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Julia Gavin and I am Danette and Blackfeet. I'm a second year AIRC intern and I use she, her pronouns. We will now begin the Q&A session. If you'd like us to ask Chef Bwapipa a question, please send a private message chat to the Zoom user named Ask Questions here. Thank you. Okay, thanks Julia. Okay, so our first question for you, Chef Wapipa, is where is Wapipa's Kitchen located? Wapipa's Kitchen is located in a commercial kitchen in Oakland, California. Great, thank you. Okay, so our next question is what oil was used before olive oil historically in indigenous food ways? Oh, wow. Um, Probably a, a lot. I'm going to say, what, there's bear fat, there's um, oh, different kind of oils. I like that question. <laughs> and then um, what else? OK, our next question is, what is one of your favorite dishes? Oh, definitely, I would have to say this is one of my favorite dishes. Um, when we do make salads, we always like to incorporate the three sisters into it. Um, I'm going to say one of my personal favorites is probably smoked salmon. Probably smoked salmon and seaweed. <laughs> That's what I, I, I grew up on. My aunt would always bring it. <laughs> That's a good favorite to have. Um, yes. The next question is, would you like to own a restaurant someday? Um, yes. Yes, of course I will. It will happen in its time. It will happen. I know a lot of people would look forward to sitting in your restaurant one day. <laughs> yes. Um, so our next question is, can you spell the name of the beans used in the cooking demo? T-E-P-A-R-Y. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question about the beans is, do you have to soak and or boil them first to get them soft? Yes. Okay. If you're just, if you're going to, um, if you're just going to make them, you would probably, I would, me personally, I always soak my beans beforehand. And then I would go ahead and put them on the, put them on the stove and let them cook for about an hour or two. It all kind of depends if you have electric. Um, this is me, my little um, scientist part. I swear, if you have gas, it will take an hour. If you have electric, an hour and a half. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Our next question, any advice for decolonized indigenous chefs looking to start their own business? Oh, yes. One, um, make sure you have um, definitely the knowledge of where you come from, of your tribe. And then two, um, make sure that um, you have a lot of passion, a lot of patience, a lot of um, endurance <laughs> as a business owner and educate yourself, even if it's in your local, like for instance, I, I work with the city of Oakland. Um, I want you know, I want to know more and more about the business part, just as a business part. But then when it comes to the part where what foods are you providing to your community? Um, definitely it's um, to me, I believe community first. And um, how would you want to serve food? And as you have to see yourself on the other side as a person that's um, eating your food and, and how they're gonna consume your food as in the health and wellness of decolonized. Like for instance, um, I really watch how I make my food in a good way, like in a clean way, you know, yes, we can have fry bread. Um, yes, but, but only once a year, <laughs> not like every week, <laughs> you know, and, all those kind of things you have to think of as being an um, indigenous business owner. But first of all is the knowledge and um, see what your tribes made and talk to your tribal. If you can email them, that would be great. If you know where, you, where your tribe comes from, that would be great. And know the protocols of actually cooking different foods on tribal lands. And that it, it goes so much more than just being your average chef. All, you know, you can just go in there and you can be an Italian chef, you can be this chef and that chef. But when you're an indigenous chef, it's a lot of knowledge. It's a lot of um, endurance, a lot of um, networking with the right people. And what I mean by that is knowing the protocols. We have a lot of protocols when it comes to indigenous foodways and we have a lot to offer for our community and our people. So you have to have that community set first. For me personally, that's my advice. Um, how can we make a difference in our community? How can we keep this going for our next generation? Those are the questions that you have to ask yourself. That was some really great advice, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is you have mentioned you have relations with food cultivators um, and do you have criteria for whom you will deal with and what are they? What's your um, Yes, it took me many, many years. I just first off want to say it took me a lot of years to have the relationships that I do with the people that I buy my food from and it it's something where it um, it pretty much took like 10 years for, the, for me to get where it is now. And now that we're in COVID, so I always still try to keep that relationship. And so we do have the maple bar, like for our maple, um, we have a good relationship with them and for our beans. Everything that we do provide, it is being sourced from an indigenous um, food business owner, even up to the farmer's market. And if I had a humongous, huge garden, I would totally grow everything myself and run in the backyard and pick it and then cook it for you guys. But the reality is, <laughs> it, I wish it can be that way. I really do. And it could be that way. But I'm in an urban area. And right now, I'm just, I'm just, I'm learning as just as much as I can just to pass it on to the next person that wants to be with Walk and Paws Kitchen. <laughs> but I've been really fortunate and blessed just to have all these relationships with other indigenous business owners and let, you know, and well, you know, if I need something, they, they give just with their heart, like, yes, I have this, you know, and 
we also have to keep in mind with indigenous foods, we are seasonal, we cook in seasons. And we also have to keep in mind, yes, I can't get 300, 400, 500, 600 pounds of wild rice. Maybe a community needs it, you know? So we all have to think in moderation on those kind of parts, you know, what, what can work and what can't. Because, you know, at the same time, it's about indigenous food ways. We don't want to go into that cultivation we don't want to go into that corporate kind of world you know and so what I mean by that that's how I believe if you can provide it this much amount okay great but I'm not going to go overly and do this and do that and make things happen but that's what it becomes when you're an indigenous chef you have those also those other responsibilities it's a lot of responsibilities but also the beauty when you're feeding your community and when you have that elder coming up to you and crying saying they had food they haven't had food like that since they're a little kid you're on the right path and I love that to me that's priceless that's really beautiful thank you for your response to that question thank you okay so our next question is um, thank you so much for your soul nourishing presentation it is pal it is palpable even through zoom oh, <laughs> I was thank you I was curious how and when you might incorporate coastal seaweeds into your dishes. Oh, good one. I love seaweed. <laughs> the seaweed is like my personal, I have a personal stash, but that's for me because um, <clears throat> I have family that um, were in, in that, that are in Hoopa <laughs> and actually went to elementary school in Hoopa. But, um, I, it's one of my, my favorites where it takes me as a child and we always have that memory um, of, you know, me, if you see a lot of berries and stuff like that, but to answer your question is um, I, I would like to offer it just maybe like as a, a, a one special or something like that, but also, like I said, I have moderation to keep in mind you know, and when it's in season and if it's on and popping in season and if I can get it, yes, you know, send me seaweed, everybody. <laughs> and, you know, I, me personally, I like it with my fried potatoes. <laughs> That's my thing. But um, just to incorporate that maybe like in a soup or a stew or, you know, something to be fun like that to have it introduced. But for me, I just have my own personal little stash. <laughs> Um, okay, so our next question is. No, it makes sense. <laughs> you do. You I'm, do. Looking at, I'm all looking at my closet because it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, can we purchase your wild rice and amaranth bar online? Is it available? Um, yes, yes, you can. They made it accessible where you can do it online. <laughs> yes. And do you ship out of state? Yes, we ship all the way up to Canada. Okay, perfect. So we'll put the link in the chat for anyone interested. And I might add that our our, our wild rice uh, maple bars are also in season and we, um, we're only doing it in season. So we have like one more month and that's pretty much it. And then we're just going back to our maple. <laughs> and we have a um, chocolate choke cherry and our chocolate is from Belize. Our choke cherries are out from the Paiute area. And then um, we have, what do we got? Oh, the blueberry and elderberries. Um, that was kind of one of my favorite. It's a hit with the hibiscus. So it's blended in with hibiscus, which I love hibiscus personally. <laughs> I want to grow hibiscus. <laughs> okay, if the link was just typed into the chat for those who are interested. I definitely am. So I will be ordering some <laughs> right up. Oh. This. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So our next question is, do you have advice for someone beginning the journey of decolonizing their diet? Um, yes, I do. Um, at me at the same time, I'm doing the same thing. And it's like, you know, um, especially when we're, we're in COVID time, but my advice would be is um, really kind of like pull the sugar, no sugar. You can do it with no sugar. That's decolonized. That's the first step is with no sugar. All that white sugar, no. 
you know, definitely with no sugar and just try to um, drink a lot of indigenous teas. And you'll feel the difference. You'll definitely feel the difference. And especially when it even comes to meat, don't get me started on that one. But um, when it comes to that, you know, it's just watch where you buy your meats and what's in it. Yeah, That has a lot to do of uh, decolonizing, a lot to do what's going, that's a whole nother subject, I know that, but that's a lot to do of um, how, what we're going through. We're in COVID times and people are fighting depression, people are this or that. But the, to me, there's a huge common denominator is what we're consuming. But that's me, okay. <laughs> I can go on and on on that one though. <laughs> That's really great advice. I think you're right. Um, so the next question is what needs to change in the culinary world for black indigenous people of color and chefs or women of color chefs to gain the recognition they deserve? Wow, good question. Um, I was just talking with another indigenous woman chef about that. Um, <clears throat> well, wow. Um, being supported more. I feel that um, women indigenous chefs, and I can speak for myself, and I do speak for my other sisterhoods, um, we're not supported as much as the men are. And that, that kind of breaks my heart in a way because there's so many women out there, women chefs that I've seen, I've known that's been doing it way longer than I have. And they're you don't see you don't you don't see them getting recognized the way they should and what i mean by that no it's not about look at me look at me 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 it's not about that it's about their work and their knowledge and their hard their hard sacrifices what they've been doing because people are building off of other people but i feel that we're all in this together as human beings and we all should support each other just as much as a, a male chef but that's you know i take that um for me as being an indigenous woman chef um I see it a lot, but at the same time, I just totally just keep on pushing and we're gonna see the change. We're gonna see the difference here in the future. There's some amazing women indigenous chefs um, all over, not just women, women chefs that are doing amazing things, but it's just about us supporting each other. And that's a whole nother subject too. See, we can have two more Zooms, maybe three. No. <laughs> That's really awesome. There's a lot of truth in what you just said. So kind of to piggyback off of your response, who is another chef that inspires you? Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. There's probably Loretta Barrett. I only how she's, in, she's inspires me is because I don't want to get all emotional or anything, but when I was in Oklahoma, and I told my grandfather, and this is before he passed, I told him I want to become an indigenous chef. And he said, you do? He, you know, we were um, at the same time, we were cleaning a squirrel. And I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And he took me to her restaurant that she had over at the Potawatomi Nation. And but it was closed and it was raining and it was closed, but he, we got to look in the window. <laughs> We got to look in the window and I got to see how her her beautiful setup was and how it spoke of everything that I vision as me because I always dreamed of this restaurant, you know, and we walked around and he said, okay, when they open, we're going to go. And um, all at the same time, we never had an opportunity to go, but it was that seat that he placed in me before he left. And I got her books and then all at the same time, um, I never had the pleasure to meet her in person, but I always had that pleasure to tell her what, what happened and what took, um, took place. And this might add, this is probably like 30 years ago. <laughs> this was a long time ago, but um, I... Her restaurant was open maybe, I don't know, it wasn't open every day. And I just remember going there and getting a menu and I got one of the menus and when I seen it and it was um, everything as I imagined 
for um, a Native American restaurant, I guess. And so that's what pretty much opened my eyes. And so she is the one that inspires me as a woman chef. That's really and she's still doing it. And this is how life is a circle. So I will be doing a virtually one with her. And I'm so excited. Now, this is, isn't that something? This is how life is such a full circle and how things that I've been doing. And then now I get to work with the person that inspired me many years ago with my grandfather. I'm sure your grandfather is really proud of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so our next question is, what are some staple ingredients you buy at the grocery store? And also, what are your favorite seasonal fruits? And thank you for being here. This person. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so what is the staple that I buy at the grocery store? Hmm, good one. You know what I always catch myself buying at the grocery store is apples and tangerines. You know, those little cutie tangerines. <laughs> I, I'm a, I can I, I swear I can I can eat about five of them so that's what I always catch myself doing but me personally I'm a farmer's market person so um, if you see me I'm at a farmer's market but honestly if I'm running in and out of a store it's either going to be I love apples I love oranges and what else hmm. oh yeah you don't want to know this one what I love of course I love that chunky monkey <laughs> But um, other than that, what was the other question? What was it? What are some of your favorite seasonal fruits? Oh, oh my goodness. My all-time favorite seasonal fruits is probably huckleberries and blackberries. Th those are my favorite because, and, and I do, um, when I do have time or when the berries are like this year the berries are so awesome so I had I had opportunity to get choke cherries and so I got a lot of those and um I had opportunity to get huckleberries and then pick blackberries because I've noticed like the past five years the blackberries has been like really really tiny but then I actually got some big ones up north and so when I see those you know I just pick them pick them and put them in my little baggie and then I bring them home and then I have a freezer <laughs> <laughs> I put them in the freezer and then I have teenagers. So every time they open it up, guess what comes out? <laughs> Mama's berries. <laughs> but yeah, that, definitely those are my favorite. And then I have, um, oh, I can go on and on about berries. I have a lot of berries, people. <laughs> yeah, I feel that my brother loves blackberries. It's his favorite mm -hmm. thing ever. Yes. Okay, our next question is, if you were to pair the three sisters dish with a dish from another culture, a cult, from another cultural cuisine, what would you suggest? Hmm, with another cultural cuisine. Mm -hmm. Hmm, well, I don't know. That's a good question. What would I pair it with? Like Italian? I, I like Italian food. <laughs> Italian? <laughs> Yeah, that could be a possibility. Yeah, I would say Italian, but that, oh, I know, um, definitely Thai, Thai food. Mm. I'm, I'm, I love Thai and Lao food. I love Filipino food. So we'll say definitely um, Thai. That's a good answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> our next question is, where can we follow Wapi Puss Kitchen? Do you have any social media? I know you have an Instagram, so we can drop that link, but any other social media pages? Um, yeah, I think we have Twitter. Um, we have um, Facebook, Instagram, the website. That's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I checked out your Facebook page and all of your all of your dishes that you post of your food are so beautiful. I'm just going to make it my wallpaper on my phone. <laughs> oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> um, someone asked, what's your favorite indigenous tea? Oh, corn silk. Corn, corn silk, definitely. I like it ice cold because it's like, I like it ice cold. So if you had to ask me about indigenous tea, but then also, oh, there's so many. Um, 
I like um, with the, the Indian tea, you know, I like that one. I like, oh my goodness, there's so many. <laughs> but when it comes down to it, maybe mint tea, well, they call it chiaka tea. I, that one, I love that. And especially in the summertime, I'm a, I'm like an iced tea person. I love iced tea. I like hot tea also, don't get me wrong. But um, yeah, definitely like a mint um, with, okay. a little, with a little lemon. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so a follow-up question to that. How do you prepare corn silk tea? Oh, you would soak it just how you would do any other tea. You just go ahead and put it in some, you can either, um, well, since it's like the hair, you know, the silk of the hair of it, um, you would definitely get the silk of the hair and just soak it. And then either you can boil it. It's really good, especially um, when it's um, winter time. And then if you already save your corn silk, <laughs> but um, it's really good for your colds. Good, good for everything. I just, something about that flavor, it's just, I love it, especially if you got a good sweet corn on there. Good medicine. We're gonna have to start getting into tea now. <laughs> yes! Yeah. So next question, what was your upbringing like in multicultural Oakland and how has that influenced your cooking style? Oh, it influenced it a lot. Um, just as you know, what people always say, um, you're from California? No, hey, you guys know if you're from California, what I mean. No. <laughs> um, just in that part, just because of our foods are pretty much almost year round. And, you know, and my favorite part of the Bay Area is definitely the farmer's market. Like I, I'll go all the way up to Sebastopol, all the way up to Eureka, all the way up. To, like I love farmer's market. And even in your guys' area, I love the farmer's market. I love the farmer's market scene. And um, I've been really happy. I went to the Hollywood farmer's market. I can go on and on about, see, that's another show. We're on our fourth show. Anyways, I, I went over there. They have some really amazing things, but um, definitely it influenced me a lot just from the farmer's market and just going to different, um, people that are grown different things and of the scene. There is also Ben Farner. He is from Oakland. He did, he's the owner of the Topley Farms. And so that influenced me a lot where, um, because we're so in the urban area and sometimes we forget, like um, we're just always on the go, especially here in the city. But when I get to go up North and I get to go spend time with different farmers and things like that, um, it influenced me a lot and just, pretty much the farmer's market. And then the other is I grew up um, with families full of berries. If you see my foods, I have a lot of berries. So that has a lot to do with California, a lot of California native influence of the berries. I love berries because they're so pretty and they taste wonderful and they look wonderful and they're healthy. You're right. Um, so besides cranberries and other berries, what are a few foods that are in season right now that you love to cook with? Oh my goodness. You're talking about squash. Oh my goodness. There's squash. There's, um, what there's turnips. I love, I like, I love turnips and then there's beets. I love, like, I have, I have this personal beet thing going on and <clears throat> definitely you can do a lot with beets and squash. Something about squash. Um, I'm probably getting everybody squashed out, but I love squash. And if you get a sweet, some sweet potato, and then you get some squash, and then just like how I toasted the um, culinary sage, put it in there. It is so wonderful. It's a hot soup. Just put in a little blender. But yeah, definitely. Um, Besides the, the dry fruits, you can have fun with the dry fruits too and make them more savory and things. But I'm going to say definitely, I love squash. 
Yeah, I agree. Squash is such a versatile food. It's like mm-hmm. you could do so food. much with it. You, you really can mix can. it with the apples. Oh my goodness, you can do so much. But I'm gonna say definitely squash. But if you're not a squash lover, try going for maybe some beans, things that has been harvested. That would be great. Um, this freshly harvested from this past September. Um, definitely some really awesome beans, or just even some greens. Yeah. This person asks, do you have any tips on foraging native ingredients? Um, Well, it all kind of depends whose land you're on and don't get too greedy (laughs) um, about picking and overly picking, but always offer, offer something to this mother earth for giving it to us. As for me, you know, that's what I always was taught and just kind of you know, pick in moderation and have that good thoughtfulness as picking because how grateful we are because I always, I always believe the grocery store is such a versatile where um, they make it seem like we have to go to the grocery store, but we don't. We can actually grow our own foods. We can actually, as we go out there and pick, I think it, it will be more appreciative. Does that make sense? Very much more appreciative. But that's my tip. And always go with somebody. If you're not unsure, like for me, I'm not a, um, I'm not a world-class forager at all. Don't have me go. I won't, I won't, if I'm unsure of picking something, I won't go. But I always, always, you know what? Always uh, meet that person <clears throat> um, that forages or, you know, go have them go with you. Because if you're unsure, don't pick it. Yeah, I like that intentionality that you're kind of stressing. Mm -hmm. Um, So another question is, what is your favorite food to prepare as a treat for you and your family? Oh, okay. I know you guys. (laughs) Um, Actually, wild rice pudding. definitely a wild rice pudding and it's so easy to make and it's something you can chill in your refrigerator and something my kids are always like okay mom can I have some you know I always have wild rice here all the time and then I have one daughter that loves squash pudding um but all of them they like the wild rice only one of my kids likes squash you believe that (laughs) I have three no (laughs) only one (laughs) Yeah, that wild rice pudding sounds really delicious. Yeah, it's really simple. Okay, this person asks, if you can't get fresh hominy, is it okay to use canned hominy? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. But you can get fresh, you can. If you can log into the Zoom, you can get hominy. That's what I say. Yeah, you can get it. But if if you want it like by tomorrow or something, yeah, you can use can, of course. Or email me and I'll tell you where to get it. (laughs) Um, So the next question is, do you keep ancestral recipes written in a special book or do you have them memorized? Most of the time I have it memorized. But speaking of a book, I am slowly but surely, I've been working on a cookbook for about five years. And so hopefully I'll have something out soon. You would think I really would have it out during this COVID time, but actually I'm busier than ever. (laughs) I'm like, hey, wait a minute. (laughs) But yeah, it goes something from the heart, you know? I'm definitely looking forward to your cookbook. I'm gonna buy it. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Of course. Um, This person asks, what is one dish you haven't made yet that you'd like to try making in the future? Hmm. Ew. Like what I mean by that is like, I wanna, I think that's one dish. I don't know, something, I love ill and I get ill, but I, I know that sounds ill, but <laughs> ill. There's something about it. I don't know. I love it. Um, and so I know you added some little sunflower petals to your dish. Are those edible? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, next.
next question. Uh, do you collaborate with or share best practices with other Native chefs? Are there other Native chefs in the Bay Area that you know? Um, yeah, there is other Native chefs here in the Bay Area. And I do have relationships pretty much with all the Native chefs. Um, I think it's, um, it's really important to um, collaborate and to talk, um, especially where we all are in the same world, but we're doing different things. Um, I have a wonderful, my best friends, we have Elena, Terry, Tawana, Bryant, you know, um, without them during this time, and we have the, what the Brian Yazis, without them at this time, it's like we gone, you know, we have to work together and gone closer together and support one another during these times. And there's some amazing, amazing chefs out there. So apart from all of the support you've had, which is great, has anyone ever doubted you on your journey? And if so, how did you stay on track? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it made me stronger. Um, especially when I was in culinary school and um, I should have known better, but then I was just so excited to be in culinary school. <laughs> and I told them that I wanted to be a Native American chef and they all looked at me funny. <laughs> like this woman, what, is she not okay, you know? But, you know, I kept to it and it made me stronger and it made me realize a lot of different things about what's going on um, in the culinary scene and about, we're just not any chef. We're chefs that um, we provide medicine, we provide healing to our communities and we have a certain responsibility. So that's what I learned from it and that's how I'm stronger. And here, I thought I was gonna cook it up. No. <laughs> That's really beautiful. And I hope our audience can take some inspiration from that. Yes, um, yes. This person asked, with so many people re-examining Thanksgiving, should people stop celebrating it or recognize it in another way, in your opinion? Oh, no, don't stop celebrating it. Just, um, you can recognize it in your own way, in your own way, you know, um, just However you, however you see Thanksgiving, you know, how that I'm just explaining how I see Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I can, you know, you know, that's a whole nother other show. See, now we're on our fifth show. And then <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just see Thanksgiving as, um, you know, coming together as family and, and acknowledging our ancestors and other foods and giving thanks like that we're all healthy and that, you um, Hopefully we're all wiped clean from this COVID, you know? There's so much things to be thankful for, especially this year. So you can take it from that, you know, and then go on forward. Remember that one time, you know? But then always acknowledge whose land that you're on. Always acknowledge um, of our ancestors' foods and um, what they paid the price for us to be where we're at today. And I know my ancestors did where I'm at today. You know, this, you can, you can um, celebrate any way you want to, but that's how I celebrate it. I think about all the people that um, fought for our rights and that are not being recognized. I think of all our people are still fighting for our rights and nobody recognized besides all the stuff we see on TV and which is pretty much garbage to me personally. But see, now we're on our sixth show. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, just whatever it means to you, as an indigenous person or a non-native person, but always acknowledge whose land you're on and what foods that are from here and from the people, because there's been so many, so many colonization, historical trauma. A lot of our food system has been wiped out, but there's so, so many beautiful people that are reviving it and fighting for it every day. So Thank you. Thank that's, you. What we're, that's the conversation we're having at my table. No. <laughs> That was a really insightful and wise answer. Thank you. So thank you. To our last question, unfortunately, I know we'd love to keep you on here all night. <laughs> but well, you, hey, we already got six shows already. So. I know we'll have to start planning. <laughs> yes. Um, so we have a comment for our last question. So someone says, let's do Zooms every Friday. We love it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Oh, uh, yes, yes. You, you guys know where I'm at on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so last question, since you mentioned cleaner eating during the time of COVID, do you have any dessert recipes without added sugar and how do you sweeten your treats? Oh, okay. Good one. Um, actually, if you, me, Okay, I have, my, like I said, I have three daughters. So one of my other daughters, she loves when I dig out my freshly harvested frozen berries, I'll take my berries out and I just got, you know, I'll get my maple and I'll just put just a little bit of maple, not a lot. And then I have blue corn and I use blue corn to thicken it up. And that is something very natural very good for you. And that's, you know, like I said, that's my squash daughter. She loves the berries too. <laughs> we, we get along great. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of my answers on that. And then you can also, there's so many beautiful different things that you can do. Like for instance, we have pomegranates are out. Do that and you can put that maybe with some chia. Do something even with the chia seed and the coconut milk. You always can put something fresh that's in season. Like um, do a, like bake a, look, we're on our eighth show. Bake an apple with a little cinnamon and then you can um, put that in there, mix that together. You can do so many different things. Or I don't know how you are about figs or even dates. Dates has a lot of natural own sugars, but only try to eat one date because they're really, really sweet, but it has its own natural sweetness. There's so many different fruits out there. And especially if you harvest it and dry it and freeze it yourself, you're good to go. You know, we always can like think ahead on that. But if you're not ready for all that, remember we do have spring. <laughs> thank you, Chef Wapebo, for your responses. And thank you for being our guest tonight. Mm -hmm. If folks in the audience would like to stay updated on what's happening with the ARC, we have Facebook, Instagram, and a website where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can watch recordings of our previous virtual events. Tonight's event was recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel sometime next week. We'll be sharing it via email with everyone who registered for tonight's event. The Center for Agroecology and Sustainability Food Systems, CASPIS, and the UCSC Basic Needs have put together meal kits for UCSC students who are in the Santa Cruz area. If you're interested in getting one of these meal kits, please sign up for them at this link. The link will be posted in the chat. Items in the meal kits include the three sisters ingredients for the recipe we just learned from Chef Wapepa and pine nut mole as well. We'd like to thank Basic Needs for putting these together. Also, please be sure to complete the evaluation form. We would really appreciate your feedback so we can continue to improve our events. Aureli will type the link in the evaluation form in the chat. Thank you, Aureli. The AIRC will be hosting one last event this quarter in collaboration with the colleges nine and 10, co-curricular programs office and the Practical Activism Conference Planning Committee. Lunch with Lila will be an hour long lunch break with Lila June, an indigenous musician, scholar and community organizer. The event registration can be found on the AIRC website at aircuscedu We hope to see some of y'all there. Dr. H, you're muted. So sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry for that, everyone. Um, good evening. I'm Dr. Hernandez, and I'm director of the American Indian Resource Center. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm Mescalero in Warm Springs Apache. Chef, you mentioned that food is medicine, and uh, we all agree with you, but you've been medicine for us tonight. 
uh, your love for what you do uh, just just shines. And um, it's been such a gift to have you as a guest tonight. Um, on behalf of the whole AIRC team, we want to thank you once again for being our guest. We also appreciate everyone in the audience for taking the time to be with us. And happy birthday, Chef. We know <laughs> your birthday's coming up. So uh, last, um, I'd like to recognize the entire AIRC POCSC team who worked to organize the event today, their photos, uh, and names are up on the slide. And uh, of course, our event would not be possible without our in-house Zoom expert, Jemzy Ortiz, who uh, our program coordinator who managed all of, all of our behind the scenes Zoom stuff tonight. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we had over a hundred people on the call tonight, Chef. So. Uh, we're really, really excited and grateful. Peace to you and your family. Everyone take care of yourselves. Thank you. say that history is written by the victors, but how can there be a victor when the war isn't over? The battle has only just begun, and Creator is sending her very best warriors. And this time it isn't Indians versus cowboys. No, this time it is all the beautiful races of humanity together on the same side. And we are fighting to replace our fear with love. And this time bullets, arrows, and cannonballs will not save us. The only weapons that are useful in this battle are the weapons of truth, of faith, and compassion. So lay down your weapons, I come. It is. 